a lot of the indigenous people are trying to fight against this. And so, you know, this is where we come together and we can come together as environmentalists and as people who kind of make their living from the land and as people who steward the land is there can be a sustainable relationship between humans and ocean and land. We just can't have corporate profits. Very well said. (laughs) Thank you. Very well said. Hey, my name is Issa Rabins, and welcome to the first episode of How We Work, a podcast I'm starting to basically interview people I think are interesting and learn what I can from them and hopefully help you learn along the way. This first episode, I have a really great talk with Maria Finn, who's someone that I feel like I actually have a lot in common with. Um, She is a forager and chef and lived in Alaska counting wild salmon. Um, She's a book author. She's about to have a cookbook come out. um, And she's also written for newspapers. And I myself have also done a lot of stuff in the food and foraging world. Um, I own a business called Forage SF that I started in 2009 that has kind of gone through a lot of iterations. I used to do underground dinners with wild forage food. So I actually cooked these 100 person eight course tasting menu dinners. Um, and I didn't have any background as a professional chef at all. Um, what Forage SF does now is teaches foraging classes. So it takes people like mushroom foraging and seaweed foraging and clamming and crabbing and just kind of like more traditional skills, really trying to get people out into nature. I've also done some writing um, on my own, but also a couple articles, you know, not too much. And I own a place called Forage Kitchen, which is an incubator kitchen for small startup food companies. So that's kind of all to say that I do a lot of things and I kind of have this complex about not being the master of anything. Um, You know, I'm certainly not the best forager. It's something I really love to do. It's why I started a company about it. But I'm not a botanist. I couldn't point out every plant and every tree in the forest. You know, other people teach the classes for my company. Um, Like I was saying, I'm not a professional chef by any means, um, but I used to charge people a hundred bucks a head to eat the food I made. Um, So it's been this kind of journey where I think what I'm really good at is following things I'm excited about, kind of creating projects, inspiring people to be part of them, right? But the whole way I feel like I'm not really the best at any of these things, you know? Um, And I think that what I've really come to terms with as my career has progressed is that I don't need to be. Um, And I think that's really what's great about Maria too. You know, she's made a whole life for herself. And I think that's really what I want to discuss on this podcast is talk to people who have just done it differently, right? To really shed light on the fact that if you want to be a chef, you don't have to go to culinary school, then pay your dues for 20 years to be a line cook somewhere, right? And that's a totally reasonable way to go about it, but that you don't have to, that you can kind of like do things your own way and make your own way in the world. So she's a really great first guest for this podcast. Uh, And we talk about a lot of really great things. Of course, not being the master of anything is a really great subject. It's near and dear to my heart. Um, We also talk about microdosing, which is something that I am a fan of. I actually started a small business educating people on microdosing because I had a really positive experience myself with it. was having kind of anxiety and depression during COVID. You know, I think like a lot of us were and started microdosing and like really came out of it. Um, Started being a lot more creative, started playing the guitar, drawing a lot more. Um, So that's something we talk a lot about and about psychedelics generally too, as they relate to mental health. Um, Cause it's something that I am personally really interested in and excited about for my own kind of personal work, but also just for society at large, I think we have this like crazy mental health crisis going on, right? Like everyone is sick in some way. And the reality is that the tools we have here just aren't working, right? Maybe they'll dumb down the pain a little bit, but like it's not a solution. Like people are not getting cured as far as I can tell. And I really feel like psychedelics are a uh, forefront and really could help a lot of people. So it's something I personally want to learn a lot more about. Yeah, so I really hope you enjoy the conversation. And thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Um, this is a personal project that I've been wanting to do for a really long time. 
And I've just really been loving the process. Um, I've been really enjoying the conversations I've been having with people and just loving the kind of nuts and bolts of editing. And I'm just really excited to create a community of people who like me and like Maria are kind of trying to make a different way for themselves in their lives and in the world. And maybe this can be a place that can help people feel better about it. Maybe it can make them feel like they're not so alone in what they're doing, right? Because I think when you're making your own way, it's really easy to feel like maybe you're doing it wrong, but you're not. So thank you so much and enjoy the talk. So Maria, thank you uh, once again for being on my podcast, being the first guest on my podcast. Um, yeah, so can you just uh, kind of start by telling me a bit about yourself? Um, sure, yeah. I live what in you're up to? Sausalito on a houseboat. And yeah, I've been here about 15 years now. I have a truffle dog, two cats, a little native oyster garden. And during, uh, and I, I've worked as a writer, uh, author, journalist, and a chef. And, you know, I moved to Alaska for nine years, where, or nine seasons, really, where I was a commercial fisherwoman. I worked for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Uh, when I was in Alaska, uh, for fun, we would go out and we would forage. Uh, we could go and drop crab pots or shrimp pots or dig clams. We could pick raspberries, get fiddlehead ferns and stinging nettles in the spring and, you know, just phenomenal wild salmon and halibut, uh, porcini in the summer, you know. So so it was just, it was a, a lot of fun. And then I worked for Fish and Game out in Western Alaska in the bush and for two summers, I ran a, a set net sites on the Yukon Delta. So for Department of Fish and Game, they want to know how many fish are going up. You can take a scale off of a salmon and it has rings on it. And you can read it sort of like rings on a tree. It tells you how old the salmon is, how long it lived in freshwater, how long in saltwater. Um, and so we would, we would do this and sometimes the fish would die in the net. And so I would take them to the Yupik fish drying camp. So the Yupiks are the indigenous people there. And they would, especially the older people, had fish drying camps up and down the Yukon Delta. Um, so, so they had next level wild, wild food, but they, you know, they ate about 70% of their food is wild and their, their incomes are quite low. Um, and so, so this, this food, especially salmon, I mean, salmon, the word, their word for food and salmon are the same thing. Um, what they did was subsistence. What I do is foraging. You know, I'm not trying to live off the land. I'm just trying to have a connection with the water in the land through wild food. Um, and so I think it's inherently a need and a want we have, you know, and, and that's another fun part about just taking walks in the city. Um, I just led a, a walking tour of Golden Gate Park and we didn't eat anything because it's illegal, <laughs> but, <laughs> and that's its own subject. But Did we didn't eat anything? Is that in quotes? Well, yeah, in air yeah, quotes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I was leading it. I didn't want to get on so long. I've done trouble. those walks. Right, right. Yeah. We're not going to, you know, well, but I was like, okay, there's one thing it's eating in base of blackberries. Right. But you know, I'm like, don't eat, uh, the roses from the rose garden. Uh -huh. you know? yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Like, I feel like that's a good line to draw. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, you gotta, you kind of have to pick and choose, but, but, and, but yeah. and there are people in this world. I think there's two kinds of people, uh, those who follow the rules, no matter what. And those who don't follow rules, it seem to be sort of random rules made by bureaucrats for no particular reason. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think we're on the same page about that kind of stuff. Like it feels like there is a lot of miners let us in Golden Gate Park. And I think I have the same approach that you have, right? Like I never have thought or try to push people to the idea that you should go out into nature to pick everything to survive, <laughs> right? Like it's just like, it's just like basically, basically like it's very, very hard to do around here anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would go, yeah. you would be very thin. Yeah, you'd it be very is, thin. Uh, yeah. Yes. And, you know, and that is, I think the basis of, of, this this crux of the issue is can human beings be in nature and not mess it up and not only not mm -hmm. mess it up be but be a regenerative part of that and that's you know i think uh, we talked about braiding sweetgrass before you know and mm -hmm. that is one reason i loved that book and she has the knowledge as a scientist and the wisdom as an indigenous person the author robin uh, wall kimmerer is 
is that yes, yes, they can, you know, but it requires being educated about it, knowing how to do it and having access to it. Um, and so if they cut access off for people from nature, how are we ever going to know how to, how to live with it? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, that book had quite an effect on me. I really, I thought it was really amazing. Just like very beautiful about like, it's kind of like when you were talking before about the indigenous folks you lived near up in Alaska, just like that, just to have that level of connection with nature and like that, like, like that depth of a relationship, you know, like I didn't grow up with it. I didn't go out with my grandparents doing this stuff. Um, so it's all like super new to me and, and the excitement and the connection is, is and the learning about it is something that really inspires me. And that's like what I try to communicate to other people too. Um, but just to have that like intergenerational familiarity um, and relationship is just like, yeah, it's very beautiful. I, uh, I was very jealous. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, you know, I know some mushroom hunters and, you know, a lot of it, same thing with commercial fishermen and mushroom, professional mushroom hunters is that like they have time in the woods and time on the water and they have a very deep well of knowledge, right? You know, 20, 30 years into it. Um, and they're not indigenous. They don't have the ancestral and they don't have the same perspectives and the same sort of take on it. But, you know, I, uh, there's a mushroom hunter, John Getz, up in Oregon, and he's professional Matsutake and truffle hunter. And he has been arguing for a long time against clear cutting. A lot of the indigenous people are trying to fight against this. And so, you know, this is kind of, you know, where we come together and we can come together as environmentalists and as people who kind of make their living from the land and as people who steward the land is there can be a sustainable relationship between humans and ocean and land. We just can't have corporate profits. Very well said. <laughs> Thank you. Very well said. <laughs> yeah, you. no, I really like that. No, I mean, I think that's the thing, right? It's like, I think that that's like, that's what I've always focused on. It's kind of like my mission in a lot of ways, like with my dinners or with the walks we do is, is to help people get a connection with nature, right? Because like when you have a connection with nature, you're going to protect it. And whether that's like you're a fisherman or a mushroom forager, or you're just kind of like a weekend warrior, like you hear about this stuff happening, you hear about the clear cuts at your like favorite mushroom spot and like, you're going to fight to stop it. But if you just go on, like you, you just kind of like look at it like through glass, like you don't have that same like emotional connection, right? Exactly. It's like, you know, if you eat herring out of the San Francisco Bay, like then if something happened on the Bay, if there was, you know, it wasn't being protected, oil spill on the Bay, that would be polluting our food source. So it's this really visceral connection to our, to our food, to our waterways. So that's exactly it. It's like take ownership and stewardship of your local areas and, and, and going out and knowing it through wild food is a really intimate connection. I mean, even more so, I think, than like kayaking or hiking. Yeah, it's an amazing thing. I mean, it really, everyone should do it. It's just really so pleasant. I oh. love being in the woods. It's just like being in the woods and it's like, it's like a hike with purpose. Oh, exactly. You know? And then, and then <laughs> the bonus, and then you come home and you cook your porcini. And I know, I know. Delicious, that's the thing. You know? And it's, that's just a bonus yeah. too. Like even if you don't find anything, it's like the best day that I had all month. Yeah. And then if I find something, it's like, oh, this is like a, a cool little fun thing I also get to do to remember this amazing experience I had today. Um as far as like what, it, you know, the benefits of overtime microdosing. Yeah, totally. I mean, I had a really great experience with microdosing. Um, I started doing it during COVID. Uh, just, you know, I was like a little anxious, a little depressed, a little like isolated, you know, just like a lot of us were. Um, and I started microdosing and it, like, I started playing the guitar. I started drawing more, like spending a lot more time, like being like, just like focusing on creative pursuits. Um, and I found that that stayed on even after I stopped. Um, I think it's really, it's like, I think it's like deceptively effective. Um, you know, cause you think like you're supposed to take like a sub, like a, um, I'm losing the word. Subperceptual. Like subperceptual dose. Right. So like by definition, you're not supposed to feel it. And so people think like, oh, that's not doing anything. But I think it's really effective. Yeah. And I started doing 
I started a little business teaching people how to microdose um, just to because I wanted to share it with people. I was like, whoa, this is a crazy, this is amazing. Um, you should really try this. Right, right. Well, and I mean, it, that's that. It's funny because I do think that like there is this sort of uh, gray area that, as a forager, you kind of live in. You know, to survive mm. COVID, a lot of people had to live in. You know, like everybody started, or not everybody. A lot of people started like cooking out of their house and selling their bread or selling meals to neighbors or you know, kind of figuring out like, okay, how are we going to survive through get get through this? And you know, I have to say, uh, personally, um, I had an older brother who had PTSD and was an alcoholic and um, was being treated and depression. He was being treated at a VA hospital in Texas, and he ended up committing suicide outside of it. And mm. yeah, and a part of that was um, he was going through very, it was in a really, really bad shape. And I offered to take him to Peru to do ayahuasca. You know, I was like, mm -hmm. I think this is the only thing that can help at this point. Um, and because my brother had, he always was troubled. It was, it was big stuff. And it, it was like, it, you know, microdosing would not have done the trick. It was like, he mm -hmm. needed to go to the jungle for 10 days and have shamans sit on his ass, you know, mm -hmm. and get those demons out into the jungle. Um, but he wouldn't do it. The rest of my family was like, oh, that sounds weird. Well, the VA hospital was mailing him jars of Vicodin, right? Uh, which Whoa. is standard practice. And then he did, he killed himself. Uh, he, he didn't die right away. He was flown to a burn unit in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I do, I think that there is something um, very powerful happening. And I really also believe, and I know you've had experience with ayahuasca, that these drugs are going to help awaken people into how do we live on planet earth in a way that we're not, uh, killing ourselves and everything else on the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, but yeah, I think it's like, I think for me, I mean, even with my, you know, my career has been in, has been about connecting with nature in a lot of ways, right? Um, like foraging, cook with forage ingredients, but recently like my experience yeah, with, with ayahuasca has really, it's really, it's changed my relationship to nature in a way that I'm still figuring out, you know, like it really does connect you in a way that is so much deeper. Right. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I, lo I love that the stuff's getting legalized, you know, I mean, I think, I think that there are so many people that just like you're talking about, I mean, that is like a super sad story. Like, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. And like, I think there's so many people in these situations that are like struggling with some kind of pain. And oh, everybody, society just everybody doesn't have, is struggling with some kind of pain. To it. Yes. Yeah. You know, but like this kind of deep, yeah, this mm. deep, deep stuff. And like, yeah, like there's just no answer, you know, no one really has an answer except to like to sedate you. Um, right. And, as and part, I think and this as part stuff of the is an answer, experience, actually. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's not, totally. you know, it's not a magic bullet. It's like I've been, God, I've been doing ayahuasca for 12 years now, you know, um, and it's you, you have to come out and make changes in your life. And sometimes you don't. You have to keep reliving the same lesson over and over again. But I do think it's it's just a remarkable tool of, you know, I, I don't know, life is still always going to have challenges and that's okay, you know, and there's always going to be pain and disappointment and, and all of that. But I think that, um, I think these things help with resiliency to it. I, I, a friend of mine is a therapist and she works with ketamine and she works, uh, with at-risk people that they get, I think they can do the treatment, um, in the East Bay and it's like $35, right? For, for that with therapy. And she said, you know, they return to these lives that are still very stressful. Uh, poverty is stressful, you know, in this country. And, and she said, yeah. but they have developed a resiliency uh, to, to the stress in their lives. And, and I think that that's one part of it. I think another part of it is the complexity and the richness of life, right? That um, I feel less afraid of dying. I mean, I'm not sick and dying. So I, I, but, you know, I, I feel like it's probably a really beautiful thing. And I also think I am more and more valuing beauty and awe and trying to make space for those two things in my life. And I think that is available to everyone, 
to everyone who can walks outside and looks up at the moon at night or sees a sunrise or sunset or a flower that comes into bloom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and on that point, like the like doing things that you're not necessarily an expert at, it's something that I'm curious about you because it's something that I struggle with myself is like kind of not not feeling like I'm necessarily the master of anything, right? Like I'm kind of like a jack of all trades. Like I'm not really a chef. Like I'm not really a businessman. Um, like I'm not a botanist by any means. Like I don't know every plant in the forest, even close to it. Um, I'm, I'm just interested in a lot of different things, <laughs> you know? And like, and so it's, it's, it kind of makes me uncomfortable sometimes. I'm like, what am I, like, what's my thing? What's my like one thing I'm really good at? And it, and it seems like with you too, I mean, you just do so many things and it seems like you do so many things really, really well. But like, I wonder if you ever struggle with that kind of that discomfort. Oh, all the time, you know, and I, you know, I don't even, I like, I make a good part of my living cooking professionally, but I, I hate to use the word chef because I just, uh -huh. yeah. I feel like I could never use chef for myself. No. It would make me so uncomfortable. But you know, yeah. but I yeah. have a chef, <laughs> I have a chef's jacket that I wear. Uh, uh, yeah, it yeah. gives you authority like that, that, yeah. you know, but I didn't, no, I, yeah. you know, I didn't yeah. stage anywhere. And I, I was doing an article on Matthew Kemmerer up at uh, Harbor House Inn in Elk, which is, he's just off the charts, friggin' talented, phenomenal, uh, perfectionist, you know, and, but I was doing uh, an article about the disappearing kelp forest and I was staging with him for the day to do that, but we went out foraging and uh, we got some sea urchin and some seaweed and stuff. And he has, you know, he's worked in Japan. He's worked everywhere. He paid his dues. And I, I did. I was sitting here going, I'm not even telling him I cook, you know, absolutely not going to even mention that. Um, and I think for staging, he just had me clean the seaweed, you know, I didn't want him to uh -huh. see my terrible knife skills, like you know, any of that. Yeah. Um, my books haven't been terribly successful and, you know, and so... Um, but I think it's the same thing. I, what I love about being able to do all this is that, uh, it, it's just this natural curiosity, right? Um, and that you get to follow this and always be learning. It's a little stressful to always be learning on the job and not have mastered it. And, uh, and, and I also think there's certain people like us, uh, you, myself, like we are pretty much unemployable in uh -huh. a corporate <laughs> setting, <laughs> You know, it's very true. Yeah. But also like, there's something. Yeah. I mean, because I fantasize about it, too, honestly, like getting a job and just the like how relaxing it would be just to have like one thing to do. Yeah. And right. All, like and very you specific, mostly just have to yeah. show up and then you have like benefits, very specific tasks. Yeah. And you would yeah. have a retirement. Totally. Um, Takes all kinds. Yeah, I Takes know. I know. Yeah. I know. And, and some yeah. people really need that security and other people need kind of constant stimulation. And you are who you are. You know, I, yeah, for unfortunately, sure. our society does not support really um, creativity. You know, it is crazy how much people like you could be a great artist uh, who's doing quite well and you're still making half as much as a mediocre uh, person doing coding. Right. In tech. Mm -hmm. And. And so I, I think that like I've been taught, you've probably been taught there's something wrong with us, you know, because we're not out there doing our, our regular jobs and have the big, you know, whatever retirement and this and that. But I'm like, why doesn't our society support uh, people that are a little more divergent, you know, people that are creative and people that can uh, support community and create community? Um, you know, if you, we, we talk about what our values are, and then we look at where does our where who, look at our pay scales. So, so it it's it's really there's certain fields uh, that pay very 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 well, and then a lot of the other ones it's you know people can barely survive. And I know we keep talking about this in the Bay Area, but you know there must be ways right there must be ways to create a diversity of socioeconomic levels that can thrive in an area like the Bay Area. Um, you know, this is part of like biomimicry, living like nature, the more biodiversity of an area, the more resiliency it has. And you look at like downtown San Francisco. Now they're probably wishing the artists, you know, weren't all kicked out. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. It is a, it's a confusing place. <laughs> it's, a con it's a confusing time. There's like more, it's like Bay Area has like more money than God and like, 
you know, more homeless people than I've ever seen. It's really sad. But yeah, no, I mean, I think, yeah, I think other societies probably do it a little bit better. You know, they help support kind of creative endeavors. And I mean, it's kind of like the patronage system, right? Like even back in history, it's like rich people would support artists because they believed art was something positive to exist in the world. Um, well, I think, I think, like we've well, lost no, it a theoretically, bit. everybody thinks art is, is, you know, good, you know, not everybody, but you know, you'd say if you, if you pulled people in the Bay area, people would be like, yes, art is important, right? We like our art galleries. We like, we like that. And, but if we look at it, we go, well, how are we supporting that? How are we? And, 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 you know, when you go, oh, artist grants, well, then what, you get 10 people a year, get what, 20 grand, 10 grand, you know, that's not, you know, wh- what we need is we need healthcare, we need affordable housing, we need like people, you don't get to be a successful artist right out of college, it takes years, you know, and, and it's, I think it's completely fine and healthy to be doing other jobs besides your art, and that you don't have to be an artist to be a creative. Um, there's a lot of things you can be doing, but like our food workers, the chefs, like you know, there's a lot of people are working in these kitchens as sous chefs. They're making maybe 20 bucks an hour. You know, where are you living in San Francisco on that? Mm-hmm. I mean, and and, yeah. and we know that people in San Francisco, the Bay Area value how remarkable our food is, you know, and, and people need to be able to work in kitchens to be able to master their craft, um, you know, and so that, so that's it. I think it really is, is like, mastering a craft or in our cases, um, doing a whole bunch of different things, <laughs> mm. but, but, but there, there kind of needs to be a, a, a way that people can, can survive and do that and learn. And then bridges for other people. If you're in a job that's soul sucking for 20 years and you really want to do something creative, you know, having that be an availability for people, you know? Yeah, no, definitely be nice to move in that direction. Yeah. Spe- well, and speaking of creativity, <laughs> you just uh, finished a new book, right? I did. Well, it's a cookbook. Uh, we're st- Tell me about yes, it. Yes, I'm so excited. Uh, so it's called uh, Forage, Gather, Feast. And it's um, it's coming out on Sasquatch Books based out of Seattle. So it's West Coast specific. So it's California, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. And it is going to be, it's food from the water shoreline, from the woods, and then from urban spaces. So sort of the flowers and the greens, um, berries and that kind of stuff. So we are still shooting it and we are just, uh, yeah, we're st- it's not fully, fully done, but I'm very excited. It's going to come out in February or March, 2024. So it's a year out. Well, that's very cool. That must be such a process. It's a, it's an enormous amount of work, and this is what yeah, this is my first so much work first cookbook. I have several prose books written, yeah, and yeah. published, but but yeah. the difference with the cookbook is a it's a lot of work because you have to test everything, you know, um, and so you have to and if you're doing it on forage food, sometimes you can't buy the food; you have to go find the food and mm-hmm. then test the recipes and then shoot the recipes, and so you'll be sort of like, wait a minute, there were candy cat mushrooms here yesterday; they're not here anymore. Oh no. Um, but what's fun is while you're doing it, you realize like people are going to get this book and not just read it, but they're going to make food from it. And then they're going to give it to their friends. And so it's almost this like three dimensional experience of a book. So that part of actually of it is actually kind of exciting and fun. And it's shot in Alaska, uh, Lummi Island, Washington, and in California. And this is all on your website? Yeah. So it's in Flora and Fungi Adventure. So that's my, oh, cool. I, my website, my my writing and like moth stories and all that stuff is on mariafin.com, which is okay. uh, my personal website. I've been wanting to go to Alaska forever. Uh, Alaska's ridiculous. Yeah. You got to go to Alaska. Yeah. It's like North America 200 years ago. I mean, there's uh-huh. fewer than a million people live there and it's three times the size of Texas. Yeah. And, but almost yeah. everybody's on the road from Anchorage down. So, so you uh-huh. just, uh, you can get off the road a little bit. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's really, I mean, I when I worked on boats, I remember being on Kodiak Island and I was standing there looking out at Shillikoff Straits and miles and miles and miles of killer whales were swimming down Shillikoff Straits. And, wow. Yeah. And then like storm petrels filled the sky and you're just, you just feel like you're witnessing this, you know, incredible sort of this way the world used to be. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Maria, for being game to record this podcast and for being my first guest. 
Um, yeah, it was a great conversation. Yes, thank you for having me. And I wish you lots of luck with the podcast. And of course, with, you know, our shared mission of, of helping to bring people gently into wilderness and find delicious food. <laughs> so. Totally. Yeah. No, I love what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same back at you. Uh, cool. All right. Thank you, Isa. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Maria. Uh-huh. Bye. So there it was, the first episode of my new podcast, How We Work. I really appreciate you being here at the nascent stages of this adventure, and I hope you got something out of that conversation. There was so much good stuff there. Maria's really great. Uh, I hope if you like this, you could share it around. I'm just starting this out, so it's a huge help to share it with someone or to leave a review, which is what every podcast that I've ever listened to always ends with, but I really hope that you'll actually do it because it would be a giant help. And if you like this or you want to talk about it or there's someone you think should be on it or you just want to say hi, uh, email me, iso at howwe.work. I'd just love to hear from you. And thanks again, and I'll talk to you next time.